Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Mark Shuttleworth uh, with Canonical and uh, Joseph Wang from oh, Inwin Stack. We find ourselves in the very unusual position of making somebody else's presentation. And there is a long and twisty story involving visas and travel and other complexities that ended up with the people who proposed this presentation not being able to be here and the people who were then going to backfill for them also not being able to be here, <laughs> most involving visas and travel. Fortunately, um, I have had some engagement and involvement with the project that's being described, uh, as has uh, Joseph and his institution. And so it falls to us to try to convey some of the ideas. Um, let me start by asking how many folks here are, uh, from, have a telco background or a telco focus? Okay, and how many folks, a few folks, how many folks are actively working on 5G or related initiatives? Okay, so in the, in the telco space, there is, um, there's sort of clear recognition that there will be another generational wave of, of the radio frequency spectrum man management allocation and so on. That will have, uh, will create a new set of possibilities, but it's also going to create a huge amount of cost, right? It's going to be very expensive to deploy that next generation um, uh, radio frequency. And so the question gets asked rightly, what are the business models effectively that will power that next wave? What, what will become possible and what will be profitable effectively? So that's, that's occupying a lot of people. Um, uh, this work fits squarely into that because a lot of people, uh, 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 one, th one thing that everybody agrees on is that 5G is gonna enable um, very high speed, very low latency type communication. And so the, the work that underpins this is all about asking the question, well, what could you do if you had very high speed, very low latency compute capability effectively? Um, what, would you, what kind of killer applications could you create in a world where you could have compute that's very, very close to a mobile device or very, very close to a car or very, very close to uh, somebody walking around? You know, what, what sorts of applications would be interesting? So that's the sort of heart of the research project at Carnegie Mellon University, right? Asking those questions, setting up the environment that would be conducive to creating a, a developer ecosystem and attracting people to that environment in order to let a killer application emerge. And then on the other side of the spectrum, you've got people saying, okay, if this is going to be a next generation telco capability, what are the standards? What are the operating procedures? How does this all work? And then what are the economics at the end of it? So that's the sort of backdrop um, to this effort. Um, I do believe that this will emerge as a class of computing. You know, if you think about um, personal computing in the desktop, that's one class of computing. There are a set of applications and the killer app, um, you know, the killer apps of the PC that are all well known. Um, and then you think of mobile computing and the apps that emerged that really could never have emerged from a PC, but they, they fit perfectly in your pocket. And those are the killer apps of the mobile era. And then you think of data centers and the evolution of data centers into sort of large scale clouds and the applications that have emerged in that environment, they could never have existed in either of those previous classes, right? Well, in that sort of same spirit, I think this is a new class of computing. Um, and it's very interesting to us at Canonical for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, uh, I tend to be more interested in the stuff that the, that the Carnegie Mellon guys are interested in, which is essentially saying what kind of developers do we need to attract in order to get killer applications for edge computing? Because I think if you have the applications, then it gets much easier to essentially justify the rollout of the infrastructure. Other people are interested in the infrastructure because they believe 5G is going to happen anyway, and they want to be able to essentially specify and, 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 and lock that down. Um, this is where all of this work is taking place. Carnegie Mellon are the sort of central um, acting agency. There's a, um, uh, a, a very lightweight structure uh, around the Carnegie Mellon effort, and there are a bunch of different institutions that have started participating in that lightweight structure. But, uh, it's very, it's very, it's deliberately light on foundations and paperwork and so on. It's been described to me as a lawyer-free initiative, uh, which sounds great. It sounds very good. Okay, so 
This is the picture that kicked it all off. It really is just saying that there are laws of physics that say if you, if you, um, if you want to be less than a certain amount of milli, certain number of milliseconds from your compute, then that compute can't be a public cloud. Um, and uh, so, you, you know, this is we're 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 really thinking about stuff that's in the less than fifty milliseconds of latency type um, uh, domain. Now, what sorts of things are interesting at less than 50 milliseconds? Well, 50 milliseconds is, I think, 20 times a second. So anything that you need to refresh 20 times a second, that's what you can do with 50 milliseconds of latency. So it's really things that require um, near real-time feedback, effectively. The classic example that a lot of people talk about is augmented reality. If you want to essentially provide somebody with um, visuals that are overlaid on the real world, then you need to, do, to refresh that 20 times a second and not be more than 50 milliseconds behind effectively. So then you need an architecture that looks like this kind of edge cloud type architecture. But I'm sure there will be many different applications. Augmented reality is just kind of the prototypical um, uh, one that a lot of people have focused on as the test case for all of this. Um, there's no doubt that these things are part of the Internet of Things, part of the connected ecosystem. There's no suggestion that these clouds are somehow decoupled from the Internet or from public clouds. But there's a very strong suggestion you know, that, that what they have to do is have to be as relatively tightly coupled to the, um, to the end user. Um, a paper was published by uh, Professor Satya, um, uh, Satya Narayanan, and uh, he goes by the name of uh, Satya. He's the professor at the Carnegie Mellon um, uh, Institution. Previously, he's done a lot of work in distributed uh, file systems, famously the Andrew file system um, and Coda file systems all came from his, um, from his work and, uh, and his lab. And uh, so he's essentially extending that research around distributed file systems to distributed compute, but bringing a lot of that expertise to the work. Um, and his postdoc group has effectively built uh, a prototype implementation of these ideas using OpenStack. They call it OpenStack++. Uh, Joseph, I think, is going to go into a little more detail as to what that looks like and, 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 and how you might use it. Um, and we've got involved in essentially bringing some more container-driven primitives or bare metal-driven primitives to the, uh, to the initiative. Okay, so this is really the heart of the story. Um, the idea is that you're going to have mobile agents, could be a cell phone, could be virtual reality goggles, could be augmented reality, could be a self-driving car, could be a robot, could be a drone, um, uh, but essentially some sort of mobile um, capability. It's assumed that, that once you want to minimize the amount of compute that you're doing on that. You know, a drone, um, uh, energy is very precious for a drone. A mobile phone, energy is very precious for a mobile phone. We see examples of this, for example, um, where you have uh, very heavy-duty applications running a phone. It tends to drain the battery quickly. If you could get those applications off the phone, then you could, you could extend the battery life of the device. That's another sort of use case. There are two primitives that are really, really important. The first is discovery. Um, OK, so I have this, this mobile agent, and it needs to find a cloud somewhere close by where it can essentially negotiate and get resources. And the Carnegie Mellon guys have done a bunch of work around that discovery sort of process. Um, uh, and then uh, the story would be, essentially, you initiate a session with, cloud, with a cloudlet you offload work to that cloudlet. You now have a relationship with that cloud. That cloudlet is less than 50 milliseconds away from you in the network, so you can have a very high or low latency, high bandwidth type conversation with that, um, with that digital twin or, or compute of whatever form it is. But you're mobile, and so at some stage, potentially, all of that work needs to migrate, and live migrate over to a different cloud. So this starts to stress and exercise um, OpenStack in, in new and unusual ways. We've all done a lot of work with live migration in the context of a cloud, for example. 
Um, you've got a hypervisor, you've got a bunch of VMs on that hypervisor, you need to do, you need to reboot that hypervisor. It's better if you can live migrate the VMs off that hypervisor, but you're still live migrating them within the cloud, right? And within the cloud, you're assumed to have consistent networking, consistent, uh, you know, very low cost, very high bandwidth um, uh, network interconnects and so on, right? You can imagine moving a VM from one machine in a rack to another machine in the same rack. You've got you know, hundreds of gigabits, if you want, of bandwidth between those machines, so it can all happen very smoothly. That's not true when those, those cloudlets might be um, some distance from each other over a WAN, and you may have high latency, and you may have much lower bandwidth, effectively, between those cloudlets. So a lot of the work that Carnegie Mellon has done is in optimizing, effectively, that process. And the way I would characterize that is that they've essentially brought together a lot of the world, a lot of the thinking that you'd find inside something like Docker with basically VM operations. In the world of Docker, it's very normal to talk about layered file systems, the idea that if you, if you, if you have, uh, you know, if you spin up a, a little copy of Ubuntu that's a blank copy of Ubuntu effectively, um, any two developers in the world can get the same blank copy of Ubuntu. And then the one developer can essentially say, here are all my changes to that. That represents my app, the installation process of my app. If this developer wants to communicate their, um, that work to the other developer, they don't have to send the whole thing because they both have the same base image effectively. They only need to send the delta. And in the world of Docker, that's done with layered file systems. Um, in this world, essentially, it's done through some very clever um, block level um, uh, primitives to essentially stream changes and compress those changes and do delta streaming effectively. There's some pretty impressive demos of um, uh, uh, VMs, Windows VMs even, um, uh, making that transition in, in a pretty short period of time, you know, this live migration of VMs in a, in a, uh, in a very efficient way over low bandwidth type, uh, type, type environments. Um, so that's the sort of heart of the, of the CMU work. Um, it's, it's enabling an agent, a phone or a car or something like that, to discover a cloudlet, instantiate uh, capability there, and then pretty efficiently translate that or migrate that to a completely different cloudlet. Um, and then that is supposed to be the, the backdrop against which applications can emerge. OK. Sensma? This, this is a uh, high-level ETSI MEC architectures. This is uh, published by ETSI, uh, and it's followed by most of the telecom company for the 5G architecture. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a now technical guy, so I cannot go to the detail. But it just show the high level how to work the mobile computing and the, on top of the, the cloud platform. And the ETS, I also publish specifications, API for people who want to develop application on top of edge infrastructures. So this is let the people, the developer or the cloud service provider to host the application on the edge gateway or edge servers. You can see in the, in the in the, this picture, this, on the button is the let me see the Mumbai edge infrastructures and the, the mobile edge application can run on top of layers. So this MEC high level API specific, what the developer need to follow to be run their application on top of edge infrastructure. And, the, and in this point, it's very important to explain about the edge cloud service providers. You can see from the user side, to the cloud, cloud services, I like, like Mark explained before, there is uh, edge, edge servers. So edge, we, we, we call CSP. Edge CSP is to ensure the SLF from the cloud side to the, to the end users. OK. So in the CMU um, research, what they have is a branch of OpenStack. Uh, and that extends OpenStack to add some key capabilities. Uh, the first is discovery of, a, of cloudlets. So you, you imagine an agent running on your phone. The, the current implementation of this is on Android. 
So you install a, an APK on the Android phone. That then is able to discover cloudlets. Um, they have, uh, on the CMU campus, they have uh, two cloudlets, and those are, those are essentially running over prototypical 5G, um, I think it's software defined, but over 5G uh, uh, radio frequency implementation. Um, the other participants in that are, I think, Crown Castle, who operate a lot of the towers in the US. So they have a fair amount of sort of practical engagement with people in starting to set up the, uh, the, 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 the actual, uh, like a, 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 a mock-up of, of the physical environment that would drive this. Um, discovery and then the instantiation of uh, VM images, they have a way to describe effectively um, how you're going to assemble an image out of some known parts like Windows 7 or Windows 10 or Ubuntu or CentOS uh, and then the, the delta effectively that, um, uh, um, that gets you to the, to, the, to the application image for this particular app on your phone. Um, uh, a language to essentially agree things like resource allocations and network addresses and so on to essentially set up the session. Um, and then the VM transition, the VM migration primitives, um, basically moving um, images around so that you can always stay sub 50 milliseconds. Um, uh, and they've demonstrated that. I think their target for so is sort of DSL type speeds. They want to be able to support DSL type speeds between cloudlets. Um, all of this is open source. Uh, Joseph? Yes, okay. Uh, currently, or we, we, we call OpenStack Plus, it's just now it's an extension of OpenStack. So you need to upgrade the Kale to every new release of Open, OpenStack. Uh, what we have done is to upgrade from the Kilo version to now to the new version versions tested. And we are upgrading to the pack versions. And the, one of the important things that like Kale done is, like Mark explained before, is the VM migration is called VM handoff. Uh, Carly do to compress the VM data and it led to migrate very quickly. So here you need to do a lot of API work with different, different projects of open state, like Nova, New, Neutron, Horizon, etc. And the way, where, actually we need to do every upgrade to every unit is, and if, if the open state community people want to join, we are more happy to, to, to ask you to join and to work with the like, the, the open state platform community. Okay. Um, Canonical got interested in this work because um, uh, I met Prof. Satya in, at the Tokyo OpenStack Summit and was very intrigued by this idea of a new class of applications that might emerge at the edge. Um, and the engagement that we've had with his research team have mainly been around thinking about the operational, you know, operational consequences of having potentially tens of thousands of these cloudlets. Um, because of the, the latency, the explicit latency target, you know that you have to have lots and lots and lots of them in order to cover a country. Uh, and that just means that you're gonna have to think about operating them in, in a totally sort of automated way. Um, most of the work that people have done with OpenStack, for example, so far is on the basis that maybe they're operating, um, you know, 5, 10, 20 OpenStacks, but not 5, 10, 20,000 OpenStacks. Uh, and the, the cloudlet concept really means that you're going to end up operating potentially tens of thousands of these cloudlets. So we've, we've been thinking about how you might essentially standardize that operation, operations regime so that cloudlets can be totally automated in a way that's very difficult to achieve uh, with OpenStack. Another consequence of the fact that it's a cloudlet is that the ratio of overhead to actual compute capacity becomes really, really important. Um, uh, you know, if you only have three nodes or if you only have eight nodes or 10 nodes, then uh, two nodes of overhead you know, is a much bigger chunk out of the compute capacity than it would be if you had 200 nodes. So um, a lot of our kind of interest is in figuring out ways to um, make this whole thing operable and, uh, and, um, and efficient so that at scale, um, the economics um, will, be, will be clean. 
Um, part of that is an interest in containerization. Um, and so we've been working with the CMU guys to show how you can do all the same things with a container rather than with a VM. Now, the one thing you can't do with a container is run a Windows workload. So they have some great demos, which are literally Windows, uh, like a paint application that, uh, that follows you around in the car. Um, but for cases where your workload is a Linux workload, a, a, a container is going to be a much more efficient way to essentially distribute those workloads and then, and then get more um, value out of that distributed compute. There are two approaches to that. One is LexD, which is VM-like uh, and has a lot of the same sort of primitives that you would get with a VM of CentOS or Ubuntu. Uh, and Kubernetes, which is a sort of Docker orchestration capability that you um, can't avoid uh, hearing at the summit, hearing about at the summit. Um, and then the last piece of the puzzle is straight bare metal. There are certain workloads where actually you might want to constitute um, uh, a full bare metal capability for that, for that offload or pass through bare metal. A lot of the augmented reality um, uh, uh, project or, or applications that are being developed depend on having access to GPGPU type capabilities. So we've been working with the CMU guys to, to enable access to either raw networking or um, GPGPU. Our goal at the end of the day is um, to, to, to enable any institution to be able to set up a cloudlet very, very cheaply. If you just have five PCs, six PCs, you want to be able to press a button and have a cloudlet. Uh, and then the next step would be essentially to enable different institutions to start collaborating so that apps can migrate effectively between cloudlets from different institutions. The beginnings of that is in place at Pittsburgh, at Carnegie Mellon. You know, they, have a couple, they have two different cloudlets. They have the beginnings of the radio frequency backhaul to support that. Um, but uh, you know, I think they're actively interested in getting more institutions um, with more diverse perspectives um, and specific interests from the point of view of the applications in particular um, to participate. Uh, the applications that I've seen to date that, that are sort of super interesting, they have one application um, in development, which is a project between a telco, uh, an, a firm of architects, a sort of construction firm, and a firm, <clears throat> and a firm that does uh, work with drones. And that application is um, essentially monitoring a construction project uh, that's just across the road from Carnegie Mellon. And so they essentially are flying drones around uh, and then comparing in real time the state of the building with the, with the um, uh, um, construction plans effectively so that they can very cheaply um, uh, sign off on you know, the quantity surveying parts of the construction project. Uh, they also have um, uh, projects in sort of industrial um, automation. So, you, you know, imagine somebody wearing a pair of goggles. They walk into an industrial site, and they're confronted with a whole bunch of valves, and they need to essentially um, walk through a process which involves detailed knowledge of the refinery or the chemical factory or whatever it is. Um, the idea is to be able to detect exactly where they are and then overlay in their field of vision exactly the sequence of instructions. Um, so that's a really interesting project. Um, and then there's a ton of sort of more common garden variety AR, VR, VR type applications that, uh, that I've seen as well. All of which is fun and, uh, and worth participating in. So that's all we had. It's, uh, uh, I have spent time with that team and uh, would, would highly recommend um, to folks who are interested in the commercial applications of 5G and edge computing to, uh, to engage with that project. What I, you know, we're also involved with some of the standards tracks and so on, um, but I think what's interesting about the Carnegie Mellon effort is that it's the most likely forum that I've seen so far for actual application development to happen. They're very concentrated on the idea of of, of catalyzing an ecosystem of developers to try to get killer applications out, it's gonna be much easier to make the business case for 5G deployments if you have a real concrete sense of the apps that could exist in that world that are impossible in the, uh, in the world that we have today. Joseph? Yes, um, just invite uh, who are interested in edge computing to join the uh, OpenZ platform community and uh, to co-work with between OpenZ and uh, Carly. Thank you. Thank you. 
If there are any questions, we'll do our best to answer. I think there's a there's a mic coming. Let's. Mark, so are we thinking about uh, a new version of OpenStack or a forked version of OpenStack with this OpenStack++? Plus Plus? Are we thinking that maybe OpenStack can be uh, relegated to this highly distributed, loosely coupled uh, paradigm you're talking about? So you know what research projects are like, right? You, 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 you try to find the most efficient way to prove a point. Uh, and in this case, I think the team has quite appropriately essentially said, you know, given that OpenStack is something that's widely uh, uh, understood in the telco environment, let's start with OpenStack and let's add the minimum number of extensions effectively to OpenStack to start showing some of these points. So I, I don't think there's anything in there that intrinsically means that it has to be a fork of OpenStack or a different version of OpenStack. I think all of the stuff could roll into mainline OpenStack. It's probably premature for that right now. Um, but you know, I think what you're seeing is just an expression of the fact that they recognize that OpenStack is at least a known quantity in the telco community. Yeah. I think there are some questions. You know, there's a, a lot of debate at the moment as to whether OpenStack itself is the right accounting system effectively for VMs at the edge. Um, I, I don't think that is the point of the CMU exercise so much as let's just stand up an environment where a, like a phone can ask for a VM and then let's see what happens. What do, what do people invent when they have that? A phone or a drone or a car or a, right? Yeah, yeah. Hi guys. Um, a question about um, hardware diversity, basically. Um, in the scenarios that you're working on, obviously there is going to be migration or um, you know, kind of dynamic management of processing locations. And in these edge deployments, at the scale that they are, there'll be a lot of different versions of small, you know, smaller hardware pools. So I'm curious about, from a, an orchestration automation point of view, if, if any of the work that you're doing is, is you know, trying to work on maintaining a, an active inventory of, of uh, capabilities that, um, you know, that are in, in the population of candidate nodes that, uh, uh, you know, that you might want to, because you may need to reject um, Right. You know, I mean, there, there are so many interesting questions there. We, we've probably most most of us have watched a lot of work happen inside OpenStack around enhanced platform awareness. Right, your ability to say, "Give me a VM attached to this kind of SRIO V with you know that kind of core behind it and this sort of latency commitment and you know basically setting more complicated, richer constraints around what you want from a VM to run a VNF." Now imagine that in a world that is much more distributed because it's not one cloud that you're talking to, but it's potentially lots of clouds at the same time. Add to that um, uh, bidding, right? So what's the price of getting that capability here? What's the price of getting that capability there? Because those may be from two different um, providers. And then add to that the idea that the app may have an opinion about that. So you know, the Netflix app may want to talk to a Netflix certified cloudlet which may be different to a, so I think it's gonna be a very, very rich area. All of that gets encapsulated in what, what the CMU guys call discovery. And I think they quite tastefully say, make that pluggable, right? At the end of the day, from the point of view of the app, the app basically says, I need to go and find a cloudlet, magic happens, great, there's my cloudlet, right? And so they've made that, I think, pluggable so that research and implementations can ex sort of evolve there without, being hard-coded into the basic idea of I've got an app talking to some compute. Does it make sense? Yeah. But you're absolutely right. Take all of the EPA stuff and then just make it, you know, more entertaining. Yeah. Uh, can you clarify about the clouded uh, terminology? It, it seems to me that what you're referring to cloudlet is uh, the light, the edge version of the cloud. Is that yeah, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, because the paper that you referred to um, 
that was the seminal um, you know, uh, research that was done, actually had the concept of the cloud that let, co cloudlet as being the third part of an application. Yep. Um, where, so, so there's a little bit of a terminology mismatch. Um, for for right, a long so time, I thought the cloudlet was the piece of the app that is closer, that, it, uh, that is in between the server and the client. Uh, now you're saying that the cloudlet is the the thing on which the uh, the edge application runs. Right. Um, Maybe useful to 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 get this alignment or clarification moving forward because um, it seems like edge node is a more appropriate term for what you're describing, and I think the industry is kind of moving towards that that term. Um, and the um, and the cloudlet. You know, so if cloud, we go cloud lit as a term, I think, predates any discussion right. of edge clouds, right? It, it, the paper was published some time ago, and it was kind of visionary, saying if you had lots of little clouds and they were close to you, what, what could you do, right? Um, I think almost everyone can map that to MEC or edge cloud or micro cloud as a concept. I don't know of a term for the agent, the, the piece of the app that gets instantiated on that cloudlet. Uh, it may be that that is what the original term meant. Um, I, I can't speak to that. Yeah. Thanks for the clarification. Yeah. Other questions? Well, let's put up the, put up the URLs um, again. Ah. <coughs> Page. The exploding. And those of you who are interested, I believe the next kind of gathering for that group is on December 5th in, uh, in Pittsburgh. Um, and if you're interested in this, then uh, participating in that either physically or, or remotely would be, uh, uh, would be very welcome. Should we wrap there? Thank you very much. Thank you.